This is Angela Pizzullo, manager of the Oral History Program with the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today is Saturday, August 3rd, 2019. We're on board the Battleship New Jersey, and our interview guest is Gordon Hay from Foxborough, Massachusetts. Mr. Hay served on USS New Jersey from 1953 to 1954 as a storekeeper and also was part of a Quad 40 Beaufort gun crew. Welcome home, Mr. Hay. Thank you very much. And what is your current age? Uh, 85. All right. And when did you enlist? On July 7th, 1952. I'll always remember that day. All right. Anything about that day that you want to share? We came through the uh, gates of Bainbridge, Maryland around midnight, and I said, what am I doing here? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that, that was a... Uh, just people watching that. <laughs> and how old were you when you joined the Navy? Uh, 18. All right. And what was your inspiration? Well, it's, uh, it's just something in, in high school. I sort of got the bug that uh, the Navy uh, seemed to be... Uh, thing to do. But then, of course, the career war was going on, and, uh, but I, sometime in my senior year of high school, I got the, the Navy bug and uh, joined, up, joined up as soon as I got out of high school. All right. And what was the process of joining the Navy? I uh, just, just went to the uh, enlistment office, signed up, and then uh, when the day came, we went through the, uh, the office in Boston, the, rec uh, the recruiting office. Went through the signing and so swearing in and stuff like that and got on the train to Bainbridge at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and arrived on a siding in Maryland around 10 o'clock or so and then got a bus to the to the base. All right. And where did you go to boot camp? Bainbridge, Maryland. Bainbridge. All right. Uh, any stories you'd like to share about your boot camp experience? Just that it, it uh, was a, a shock to the system. That's all, you know, really. We, uh, you know, get the haircut right away, and the, the uh, probably the, the the big thing was service week, where everybody had to uh, do a, uh, a special assignment for that week, and I get stuck in the uh, scullery in the mess mess hall. Uh, this is the middle of uh, August in Maryland, mm -hmm. and, and this was washing dishes and stuff like that, and there was no air conditioning in there from what I remember. But uh, other than that, it was just the drilling and. Uh, and meeting new people from different places, and it was, you know, we had a good uh, group, we had a good company commander, and uh, first class gunners made. All right. And where did you go to A school, if you did? Uh, Newport, Rhode Island. All right, and what was that for? Uh, storekeeping. I went to uh, Class C as well, two, two schools. Okay. Now, um, when you first found out you were being assigned to USS New Jersey, uh, as we discussed before the interview, that was your first ship. Right. When you got the orders, what was your reaction? Well, first of all, I was one of three or four guys in this Class C school who was not assigned to a ship. In other words, they came from ships and were going back there. So the three or four of us that had no assignment. And uh, they took you in order. They had like four billets available. New Jersey was one of them. And I was the last to pick, and I was kept my fingers crossed that uh, New Jersey would still be there when I, my turn came. Cause they, everything was indicating was going to go on a around the world cruise, and that appealed to me. Little did I know it was only half around the world cruise to Korea, but mm -hmm. that made no difference. But that's I got what I wanted. And what I wanted you? sea duty. I well, didn't want some supply ship or some uh, uh, base on on land. Right. And what was your reaction when you realized you were getting to New Jersey? Well, I, when my my reaction was when I saw the ship, and I was kind of in awe when I saw it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually my next question. Yeah. Um, where did you meet up with the New Jersey, and what was your reaction when the first time you saw her? Well, I met, it was in Norfolk, Virginia. It was in, uh, what I said, uh, end of, n middle of February, and uh, I took the train down from Boston after going home from, from uh, school, and uh, got the train down to Norfolk, got left on a siding, North in Norfolk, and we caught a ferry across to the to the center, and then uh, went out to the uh, got a cab, I guess, out to the base, and left my sea bag behind. Had to pick that up a few days later, but it was quite a sight. Mm -hmm. I had never uh, I had never seen the ship before, but I knew it was a it was a, a warship, and it was would be doing seeing some action and, and uh, going places. So, all right. Um, just to clarify, that was in uh, February of 1953? 53. Correct. Okay. Now, um, 
This question is more open-ended, but uh, just ask you about everyday life on board. Um, not so much the more specifics we'll get into, but just your everyday routine as a sailor. Well, it was, uh, you know, up at six o'clock or whatever and have the have chow. Sometimes you uh, you form the chow line out, outside, uh, topside, and then uh, on rainy weather, the, the line formed down below decks right through our compartment. So it was kind of busy there some mornings. Uh, then when that was over, we I headed down to the uh, store on the second level where we went before and uh, uh, I, we would, there were five of us I believe in, the, in that group, the, the, uh, the head top guy who was a, a third, second class goalkeeper, and the other four of us were seamen. Uh, three of us were sent to, had specific storerooms assigned to them. Each one had two, uh, two locations, each with the four storerooms in it and we were there to uh, help guys who needed, you know, ship's parts for, and then we'd spend the day there and uh, then chow again and then back down below again until four or five, whatever the uh, stop time was. And then uh, it was just relaxed and uh, uh, we had a few guys on there who uh, liked uh, country music, maybe down in the mess hall uh, playing on the guitars and go wandering down there and listening for a while, maybe go to the library or Go to sleep. <laughs> Did a lot of sleeping in those days. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be a favorite pastime. All right. Where you could sleep down there. <laughs> All right. Um, now, what about uh, you? Already talked about your duty station. Uh, describe a little bit of your job, your day-to-day -day routine, and what you did as a uh, storekeeper. Was uh, said so had uh, two locations with four storerooms each, and we uh, had ships repair parts in there, which were kept in steel boxes, some small boxes, some large boxes, and they were extremely heavy. And you, I think you saw down, on the, they had compartments within, and they were all in those locations. And all those locations they had to be on a master list in the, in the main uh, spare part storeroom. So if somebody came in, they needed a spare part, they, we could look up in the book and tell them exactly where that was, what storeroom was in, what been in that store than it was, so uh, that basically was uh, the way it went, and uh, that's that's about it. All right. It was big for ships' parts, we, we not general supplies. It was, that was in a, up in the forward area. Of the, the right. So you specifically were the storekeeper for yep. repair yep. and replacement any, parts. Any uh, any equipment on the ship. Okay. Including the boats, the officers' uh, yachts. All right, so what was the system of replenishing if someone pulled parts and you needed to get more? What was the replenishment system? You fill system? out the paperwork when, it was, when they drew the supplies. Paperwork went up to the supply office. Somebody typed up a requisition for that part, and uh, when you got to supply them together and get near a supply ship, you'd send them over to the uh, supply ship and wait till they came back to you. It took, took a while sometimes. But was uh, one ship, one supply ship over in, I think it was Sasebo or Yakuska, where they needed a bunch of parts. And um, one of my jobs was to code a, a part number on everything we had because they didn't have that. And uh, I was sent over to the supply ship to uh, pick up some supplies, had all the paperwork, all the code numbers. And one of the guys in the, uh, on the ship happened to be a former classmate in the storekeeper school. So I got pretty good attention, but I had all the correct numbers, and I went back to my ship with all the stuff. And they were, "How did you get that stuff so fast?" <laughs> so, but that's it was the, the series of paperwork from us to the uh, supply office up on the second deck where we passed before, mm -hmm. and then the, the supplies would come in, and we put them back where they belonged, and uh, uh, wait for the next next okay. issue. Now, what was your uh, general quarter station? 40, 40 millimeter quarter up in the 05 level. All port, right. port side. Okay. And uh, talk about the uh, quad 40 Bofors. Uh, what was, did you, what job did you have a part of that crew? And what was the process of loading and firing the quad 40s? Well, I had 40s? a gun, gun captain who was a, a gunner's mate. And then there was uh, probably seven or eight other guys. And there would be, uh, there were four four slots for the shells and there'd be four guys, one at each, and you had guys down 
outside who would pass the shells up to this guy here. There were four shells with a clip. And you take that and you push it down inside a slot on top of the gun and it would pull off the clip and the shells would go into, into place. You push them until they got contact with whatever. And then you just, guys would just keep on handing the things up, keep on handing them, guy would keep on pushing them in, maybe going out the other end. But so that was, and we stood watches. With general quarters, we didn't have much to do because nobody, we never any, had never had any incident with a, with a, with a plane. We just, there was just no opposition, but we had to be there anyway. Mm -hmm. Number of times when there was general quarters and uh, particularly up at Juan San, which was uh, probably the, the, the worst place. That was the only place we were ever fired on. And they fired uh, anti-personnel shells, shrapnel, you know. So uh, sometimes we'd be sent down below because there was no need for us and they didn't want to expose us to the flying shrapnel, you know. They said we were fired at 20 se 28 separate times. That's 28 shells. And the whole time we were over there. Mm -hmm. 25 was on one day. That was all up at one sign where the, the uh, UN troops had a couple of islands in the harbor that were, they were occupying. And they were surrounded by North Koreans. So whenever we weren't around, these guys got shelled pretty heavily. And uh, when we go out to see it, and I could see the whole sky light up again where they were getting, uh, getting shelled. But that supposedly was the longest naval siege in history. The, the whole war of it there mm -hmm. at Wan San Harbor. All right. All right. Uh, actually, that was part of my next question. Uh, <laughs> the pattern of the firing missions while you were off the coast of Korea? Mostly uh, the 16 inches bombarding, like uh, railroad lines and supply depots, stuff like that, mm -hmm. troop movements, uh, and sometimes the five inches would be used for shorter range stuff, but we, we never fired anything except in when we were doing drills. So when you were, when you were at General Quarters, you did get to hear the five, uh, the oh, sixteen yeah. inch gun? Describe yeah. the firing of uh, the sixteen inch guns. Just a dull thud. It was not, not uh, bad at all. The five inches were worse. They'd go right through you. Mm -hmm. But the 16 inches was like a, just a, a thud. Because I'd I be up on the 05 level at my, at my gun spot. I'm taking, trying to take movies of the guns going off. But uh, uh, never quite made it because by the time the buzzer went off, the shell was already gone. I hadn't got my camera up yet. You know? All I got was a puff of smoke. But it was, no, they were not, not bad at all. It was a little vibration, but people say that you must have been terrible. But no, it wasn't anything like that. And I was pretty close and right above them. Right. Did you have any hearing protection of any kind? No. Nope. Never, never heard of it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, now you would. Uh, you said Wansan was probably the one that, that you fired on the most. I would. Say we. Yeah. I would say the most. We went to other places too, but Wansan was. So you would start at Wansan, maybe go down the coastline they and back and do, forth. They, well, they usually do one location in a day. Mm -hmm. uh, Places that it was uh, Hong Nan and uh, places like that. We might have shelled once or twice, but we all seemed to wind up at one time. Okay. Because these guys on these islands, I guess, were vital for intelligence or whatever. Wanted to give us as much protection as they could get, as much as we could do. Because you could see that when the smaller ships were there, it didn't uh, bother the North Koreans at all. They just fire away. But, I mean, we had the guns that would phone right in on their. Uh, on their positions and knock them out. I used to hit railroad. There's some of the stuff was on railroad. They pull into the side of the mountain and then come back out again and back in. So, but uh, we could get a pretty good line on them. And, uh, so that was our day at one sign. Mm -hmm. But other days we'd be uh, shelling someplace, and uh, the child lines would be up topside. You know, like nothing was going on. And uh, it was just like, and there were a few times the band was playing too. <laughs> but, but uh, anyway, that's all right. That that was a typical uh, general quarters day. All right. Now, did you have any interactions with either Captain Melson or Captain Ackerson? No, no. All right. He was he was thought to be a pretty good guy. Melson was. Mm -hmm. He was he was fairly popular. 
All right. Now, um, when uh, there was, were you on board for their change of command? I believe so, yeah. All right. Uh, did you notice anything different no, between not the really. two as far I as command I wasn't style? on there long enough after the change of command to really All right. notice anything. Did you attend the, the change of command ceremony? Oh, or? yeah. What, what, what was, was that like? Just, <laughs> just like any uh, ceremony that, you know, it's, I, I can't really put that into words, but it's. It's just like any other ceremony when someone gets a big promotion and just it was a military thing rather than a civilian. Mm -hmm. I mean, the formality and all that stuff, the, the, the protocols they go through, but you know, you, you see one of those ceremonies, you see them all really. Okay. Now, were you on board uh, for the visit of South Korean President uh, Singman oh, Rhee? Yeah, I was. Um, what did anything that. No, he just passed through. All right. He just passed through. He didn't. Congress with any of us, so we probably went right to the Admiral's quarters and stayed for a little while, and that was it. We, we manned the rail for him and all that stuff, you know, uh, when he came aboard, obviously. Mm -hmm. But that was that was the extent of it, nothing. All right. We wouldn't have never known he was on board if he didn't, you know, come by us with the Admiral, but you know, it was nothing big here. Yeah, okay. They tend to overlook you when they come on for big shots. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, uh, you were on board when the uh, Korean conflict ended, so yeah. do you remember what the reaction of the crew was and did, how did you oh. celebrate and anything oh, yeah, of that? Oh, it was a big celebration, but we were obviously very happy because uh, that meant we didn't have to go through all the bombardments again and we could get a more normal life. And Twelve of the crew were actually part of the uh, uh, honor guard at the uh, signing ceremonies mm -hmm. at that pen with John. It took twelve of that. Sailors to be part of the honor guard. They took somebody from each service, I guess, and as I say, a dozen of our guys were part of that, which was something special. But. All right. Now, after being relieved by uh, your sister ship, the USS Wisconsin, uh, the New Jersey did bring some sailors and, or excuse me, some soldiers and Marines home. I believe so. Yeah. Did you get to talk to any of them? Did Not they share really. any they stories? They sort of stayed by themselves, and that's sort of the way it was. All right. Unless we had a reason to interact with them, no. Okay. So these are some more general questions mm -hmm. about your time on the New Jersey. Uh, so any ports of call stand out that you went to that during was, that time? That was one of the, the reasons I wanted to go to sea was going to different ports. And uh, of course, it was the Panama Canal. Was, we went to Long Beach on the way over in Hawaii. Then uh, several ports in, in Japan. Sasebo and Yokosuka were the two main places that we went to Nagasaki, which kind of surprised me. I was, it wasn't what I expected it to be. I expected it to be uh, all flattened, but they were actually were buildings standing, you know, that were there when the atom bomb went off. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another protocol was Beipu on the western part of Japan. And we went to Hong Kong, as you know. And then uh, back to uh, Back to Hawaii and Long Beach and Panama and Norfolk. All right. We did go to Europe, though, in 1954 on a midshipman cruise. Okay. Now, did you have a favorite port of call? I, I think both uh, Sasso and Yokosuka were right, right up there at the top. Because mm -hmm. we were in there often enough, and it was, uh, you know, it was a good place to, to, uh, have liberty and uh, enjoyed it. Uh, we went to Hong Kong. I only got on on the uh, went on Liberty one day, and the rest of the time it rained. So uh, Panama, we went on Liberty one night, and that was almost got into a fight because <laughs> they weren't they weren't very uh, tolerant of the Navy. You know? mm -hmm. And then later on, we went on a midshipman cruise. We went to. Uh, uh, Vigo, Spain, and up to Cherbourg, France, and took a three or four day trip to Paris. And then I got, get, uh, after that was over uh, several months, I, I was off, went to Germany. Okay, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to uh, ask you about a particular port of call uh, in Hong Kong in August of 1953. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about that experience? Uh, I believe the uh, August 26th, the, the uh, citizens of Hong Kong were invited on board and yeah. got a little... It, yeah, there was all <laughs> kinds of uh, junks and 
sampans and yachts. They all wanted to get to the gangway, gangplank going up at the same time. So it was all spread out and you could walk from one boat to the next. And apparently during that, the uh, couple of kids fell overboard and they were just lost. There was no way to get to them. And uh, so that was the, the, the bummer on that trip. But mm -hmm. they were ferry boats going around the ship uh, from the showing Syrians and they'd go around and they'd turn around and come back and as soon as that happened, you'd see that. The ferry tilt from one side to the next because they'd all run from one side to the next. So I could sort of get an eye what what happens when they, one of these ferries open that part of the river when it gets when it sinks or something because they're, you know, they're not, not too sturdy. But uh, we had, uh, while we were over there, almost every day we had vendors coming on board, tailors, all furniture, selling to the, to the crew. I could pick up a couple of good suits for about 20 or 30 bucks a piece tailor made. And uh, I was telling the kids earlier, there was a, one of our group was a tailor in civilian life and assured us all of this stuff was top quality. So that was that, that was the big item, suits. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd come and they'd take your measurements and two days later they'd have a new suit. And uh, so that was, that was Hong Kong. But as I say, it rained every other day, so it was not, not the ideal weather for going, going over and, and uh, doing the tourist stuff. Right. It, was a nice, it was a nice break from uh, the routine, though. It was an interesting place, really. And uh, but, uh, that was, the, that was a, a week we were there. Okay. But that, that incident with the kids getting lost, that was, there was absolutely nothing that could be done to save them because it was so... So mobbed. But it was every kind of a boat you can imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were all trying to get there. They yeah, were trying to visit the ship? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. just see it? Only so many could get, but I mean, most of them got on, but it was a, it was a chaos. It was chaos. All right, you did mention you uh, traveled through the Panama Canal. And um, were you topside when, during oh, yeah. that? Oh, yeah. Can you describe what it was like trying to get through? Tight. Very tight. Mm -hmm. You could see the smoke coming up from the sides where it was scraping the uh, edge of the locks. But uh, it was, uh, on the way back, we actually got stuck. We got stuck in the, in the silt or something. It, and uh, it took a few hours for the ship to be pulled loose. Of course, that made all the newspapers, and I'm sure made everybody <laughs> very happy to, to read. But. Uh, it was uh, it was just like sailing up a river until you got to the locks and then you, you go through that process of uh, going through there. But we were very tight. There was not any room to spare. If we'd have been a couple of inches wider, we probably wouldn't have made it through. Yeah. And for the record, the uh, Panama Canal at that time was 110 feet wide. That could very well be. And the battleship was 108 feet three inches at her beam. Sounds, sounds pretty close. Okay. So that gives every, that'll give a. Uh, Historians an idea yeah. of when you're saying how yeah. tight. Yeah. All right. Now, did you um, did you cross the equator? No. All right. That that came after, right? I think in the '80s. All right. That's when they went to the equator. Mm-hmm. We so went, you're we so you across the international state line, but that wasn't a big deal. All right. <laughs> All right. So, are you a shellback? No. Okay. All right. Now, after your time on the New Jersey, did you serve in any other ships or stations? I went, I transferred to Germany. All right. Uh, Bremerhaven, Germany, to be exact. Okay. Now, before that, um, when, when you disembarked in New Jersey, mm -hmm. where did you disembark? I went to Brooklyn, to the receiving station in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I went by train, I, I think, up, up to, uh, to Brooklyn and took a cab over to Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn. Right. to the receiving station over there. And that was uh, what, what day in, or that what month in your... At late October, early November. I was there about two weeks. Right. Was in New Jersey, was this when the New Jersey was coming in for her uh, retrofitting in 54? Uh, it was in dry dock mm -hmm. in 54. But that, that was all just, a, you know, uh, dry dock maintenance. That was nothing. Uh, in fact, the, I'm trying to remember if it was still in dry dock when I left. It was about that time in, uh, in Portsmouth. Okay. Yeah. All right. I so do remember one thing about uh, 
the, the time I was in Portsmouth, a, a buddy of mine who lived in the, nearby in Massachusetts uh, asked me to go see his mother at home and get some civilian clothes and bring it back to him. So I did. I went and I got the civilian clothes and I came back and I'm going through the gate at Portsmouth and the uh, Green Guard says, what do you got in there? I said, civilian clothes with a, a friend on ship. He says, there's uh, been an order that there's no civilian clothes to come on base that's going to anybody on the ships. So I'm standing there at midnight on the street corner in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. What do I do with these clothes now? And uh, all of a sudden along come three Marines off of Liberty. One of them saw I had a problem, so he asked me what the problem was, and he, I told him. He says, give me them, give me the clothes, and come with me. So uh, the four of us marched through the gate. He got my clothes, and two or three gave me the clothes, and I took them to my buddy on the ship. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but just the timing while I was on leave, they changed the policy. Here. But it's not very often you find a Marine that's going to do a favor for a sailor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so when you got your orders for your next station, was that something you requested yes, or did yes. it come out? That right. was mainly because the word was the, plate, the ship wasn't going anywhere for over a year. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was not what I wanted. I wanted to, you know, go someplace and not, not go down to Gitmo a couple of times. And, and, and uh, that be it. So I put in, actually three of us put in for Germany. And two of us got Germany and one got London. Yeah. So. Now before that, um, the New Jersey was part of a cruise with the other three Iowa class ships. Were you on board? Yeah, uh, yeah I was. Did you actually get to see the other Iowas? Yeah. Oh yeah. Can you describe just looking out what that scene was like to see pretty all in, four? Pretty, pretty impressive. That's what, the, what you can say is impressive. Mm -hmm. I got a picture of it at home. The uh, Jerseyman newspaper I had a picture of that on the front page one morning, so I, I kept that copy. Yeah. <laughs> and for the record, that was the only time all yeah. four Iowa yeah. steamed together, yeah. even right. though they served together in yeah. the 80s. That was just before we went on the midshipman cruise. All right. So talk about the midshipman cruise. What was that like to have <laughs> uh, future officers of the well, Navy on board? We had a few ROTC guys from Tulane University assigned with us, and these were really pretty nice guys. Got along with them very well. And uh, the midshipmen from Annapolis are a different story. They more or less acted like they taught to act in, at Annapolis. You know, we're, you're down here and we're up here. But, uh, but we'd had no, really any interaction with them because we didn't have them working with us. And they didn't associate with us. So uh, they took over our sleeping compartment though. For that we were upset with them. We had a, and the storeroom, spare part storeroom, we had to clean out one of those completely so they could put their luggage in there. So we had to clean out those four storerooms and had to plug them up to the uh, general stores up in the forward part of the ship. And we got a working party of uh, deck crew because there was a lot of stuff and it was heavy. So we just, some of it moved in the morning and uh, Broke for lunch. Uh, lunch was over. Where's our working party? Not one of them showed up to, to finish the job. And I went to the officer of the deck and uh, I explained the situation. His attitude was basically, you guys are storekeepers, you don't do anything anyway, so I'm not gonna send you in. Make my guys work for you. Somehow we got it all done, but that was the attitude. But, but we caught it, you know, we had to move our stuff out so the luggage for the midshipmen could be put in there was not another thing that, that uh, impressed us. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any other stories about your time on the New Jersey before we move to uh, your duties in Germany? No, uh, not really. I was thinking some things, but it, it's all past. You know, a lot of years has gone by. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, just the, the general uh, I did enjoy the time on the ship, and we got to some nice places that, you know, probably never get to. And when we went to Hawaii, the only thing there was the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. There was none of all this other stuff that's there now, you know. So it was a big deal to go to the Royal Royal Hawaiian, Royal Hawaiian and have a drink at the bar, you know. But mm -hmm. that's, that's, you barely see that now, right? All right. So uh, talk about your arrival in Germany. Okay, I went over on a troop ship. I forgot okay. what the name was, but we left from Bayonne, I think. 
and it was in, we got there about the 4th of December, so it was in the winter, but there was a small group of us from the Navy in a, a certain compartment, and all the rest of it was Air Force and Army, and uh, every once in a while you'd hear the uh, cover of a trash can go landing on the deck, and some airman or, or soldier was leaning over in the bucket, you know. <laughs> And we'd give them a little bit of the business. So they were all waiting for one of us to, to uh, do the same thing, but we didn't oblige. But uh, you had <laughs> cleaning parties, and, and uh, of course, they were big compartments, big. Mm -hmm. And uh, our compartment was uh, a first class boatswain's mate, I believe, it was a part of the crew, a part of our group going over. So we. A few of us volunteered to help them out, and you know, don't well, don't volunteer. That's what we should have not done was volunteer, because uh, there's nothing like a, a Navy boatswain to, to make sure you have a clean place, you know. So we uh, that was what we did to keep you busy on the trip over. And we didn't really, even though it was winter time, it was not really a a bad trip. But we got to Bremer Harbor; it was all fog. And they were going to keep us out in the. Uh, North Sea for overnight until the weather cleaned up, but, but we managed to get it all right and so uh, dis disembarked and went over to the Navy base in Bremerhaven. Uh, the ones who were going to Germany, some of them got off other other locations. So and we basically handled uh, uh, moving the supplies for the Rhine River Patrol, and, which was just a formality at that time. But mm -hmm and handling the household goods of uh, guys coming into Germany for the Navy. It was, a, it was an office job. I just delivered a, had a, a truck that I delivered supplies to some of the other parts of the, the bit set up over there. Yeah. It was a good job. I enjoyed it over there. Of course, I met my wife over there, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you were there in uh, 54, correct? Yeah, 54 through 56. All right. Did you actually, uh, could you describe what the cities at that time, were they rebuilding? Was it there still? Was a little bit of a, of a trace of damage over there. There was an old church that was pretty well bombed out, and it was still, it's been all re re uh, redone now. It's, it's all uh, back to uh, condition. But other than that, you see something every once in a while, but otherwise it was like normal. And we worked with uh, German civilians, and we got along fine. And uh, back the first time I walked into the office, uh, one of the civilians, uh, asked me if I smoked, because <laughs> the, the deal was uh, uh, they like to buy cigarettes off you, American cigarettes. So he was my, my customer from that point on. You could get two cartons a week. I got one and I sold him the other for some. And they split it up amongst them. But uh, that was uh, my introduction to the office my first day. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so your job in Bremen? Bremerton was basically, Bremerhaven, excuse me, was the same, you were still storekeeper? Oh, yeah. What were but you? But it was more of an office job and, and mm -hmm. a truck delivery. I had a, a German kid, civilian, a kid who worked with me. He loaded the truck. I drove the truck. He rode with me. I got to where I was going. He unloaded the truck, and I drove back to the base. That was the, and you'd that's some clerical work. And you'd be supplying ships coming in? We A ship would come in occasionally, or a destroyer or something would come in, or a... Uh, one of the, a couple of the troop ships were, were Navy ships. Mm -hmm. Most of them were merchant marine, but there were two Navy ships, and I guess we would maybe supply them with something they needed, but it wasn't a big call. Okay. So yeah, the naval presence in Germany at that time, was it light? It was, uh, yeah, very light. They had what they called the Rhine River Patrol, which was down around Heidelberg, and, mm -hmm. that, and that was just a, it was just there, because they, they had no real, thing to do that was that power had passed along out of them to the civilians so they but they still maintained a presence there yeah. and that was considered good duty but uh, uh, other than that there was there was nothing in, Ger in Germany really so this was um, if I'm, this was not quite the beginning of the tensions between the Russian occupied Germany and our occupied Germany the I mean, we're talking like the onset of the Cold War. Yeah. Did, how uh, was, was that? What was it like then? Well, we had a, a detachment that went to Berlin for either, I guess it was Armed Forces Day in 19, 
I can't remember if it was 54 or 55, but at any rate, we had to go there and march at Templehof Air Base. And uh, we had to travel by train from Bremerhaven to Berlin overnight. And you kept the shades down going through East Berlin. You were, they didn't want you looking out at what was going on. And uh, God forbid, when you were going through where any Russian troops were, you took a, sh a camera shot of them. They stopped the train and, and grab it away from you. Uh, but we uh, were able to take a bus tour of East Berlin. That was before the wall. Mm -hmm. It looked like they hadn't they'd even done more damage after the war. It was all completely rubble, except for one street, which was named Stalin Alley. That was all dressed up, but everything else was just rubble. And uh, went through Brandenburg Gate, and they get another, they said on their bus, don't take any pictures out the window or anything like that, because they'll, they'll stop it, stop the bus, and you would be having a, a problem. So, but it was, it was the tensions were going on, yeah, but they hadn't built the wall yet. Mm -hmm. That came later. Okay. All right. Uh, any other memories of uh, Bremerhaven or your time in Germany? Yes, so we, uh, we made some friends with the German civilians over there, a number of them, so we had a that kind of a good relationship, you know. It was a friendly situation because it was not a big uh, spot for American military. Mm -hmm. The big group of American military is down in the central part of Germany, Heidelberg, Frankfurt, mm -hmm. and there there was all kinds of tensions. But up in Bremen, everybody got along fine. All right, I have to ask this as someone who did many years later, did you get to an Oktoberfest? No. <laughs> uh, up in northern Germany, they don't recognize it. Okay. That's a, that's a, a southern German, that's a Bavarian. Right. And we don't, you know, and they didn't have their own Oktoberfest, so mm -hmm. they didn't do that kind of celebrating up there. Yeah. They're more laid back. All right. Uh, now, did you have any other stations after that? No, that, that was it, other than uh, just the places I passed through. All right. So, uh, when did you get out of the Navy? Uh, it was the end of the uh, beginning of July, end of Ju uh, June of '56. Okay. And through Philadelphia. All right. And is this the first time you've been back to the New Jersey since? No, this I was embarking? back, and there's been some debate about how long ago that was. Mm -hmm. It was a number of years ago. When did the ship come over here? We opened up to the public in October of 2001. So that's 18 years ago. So right. It's not 30 years ago, like another thought. 18 years ago, so probably 15 years ago. So now, 30 years ago, she was still active. Yeah, if I'm yeah. doing my math correct, yeah. 2019. I, I thought it was uh, around 15, 15 years ago. We right. We, came, we made our last trip to Atlantic City then, and we popped over on by the bus. Right. Actually, yeah, 1989. That's uh, yeah. She was actually getting ready for her Pack X yeah. cruise so 30 years ago. Good, so, yeah. All right, and. Um, so let's uh, just do a little reflection. Um, well, before that, actually, I'd like to ask you uh, just about your post-Navy life, your career, family. Well, I, uh, I got married over in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got home, I went to school nights. I went to school for 13 years nights uh, to get a counting, uh, counting bachelor's degree and master's degree. But like at least two nights a week or sometimes four nights a week through the summer, too for 13 years, so <laughs> that was a, and then I had a course, I had a, had a job for a couple of different companies, but, mm -hmm. uh, and then gradually, say I was in the accounting field all the time until I retired uh, at 65. Okay. I worked, I think, for two or three companies, but there were, it's like there were some takeovers involved, but we're in one company now became a, another one, but I still stayed there, you know, so, but that's, very exciting accounting life. All right. <laughs> and family? Four children and mm -hmm. uh, three girls and one boy, and then seven grandchildren. All right. And looking back um, on your life, what impact on your life did naval service have? How did that influence well, I think you? it gave me, some people might argue at this point, but I think it gave me some discipline that I wouldn't <laughs> have had otherwise, you know. And. Uh, it, uh, I think it, it, you were still 
I think, a, an offshoot of the greatest generation at that point. And I know the Navy is at all military, but it's changed a good deal since then. And uh, I think the old ways were pretty good, you know. Yeah, it's, basically, it was, uh, it was an enjoyable time. I can't complain. I had, a, had good, good uh, duty stations and, and uh, had no complaints about it. All right. And our final... I, I think it got me to Sorry. grow up a little bit, too, you know. Maybe mm -hmm. concentrate on, on uh, you know, a career and, and, and working uh, towards some goals. All right. So. And finally, um, this might be viewed by historians, uh, educators, uh, well into the future. Is there any legacy statement you'd like to leave about your time? I really can't think of anything right at this moment. I, mm -hmm. if, if I had some time, I might be able to come up with something. I just uh, hope that, and I know all this, uh, the good that's come out of this rubbed off on my kids, and that's the, the main thing. And to keep your grandkids got a good family. Mm -hmm. That's that's the yeah, the big point. So if, right. if there's any any achievement, which most of which is my wife's fault, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's the best you can hope for. All right. Any last um, any stories that might have come to your brain, mind uh, yeah. while we're interviewing? I. I think we'll, we'll call it a day. All right. I, I, I've, I've lost thought on some of them. No. Understood. All right. Well, thank, again, thank you for your service and taking time to join us. Uh, this concludes our interview. And this is Angela Pizzullo, manager of the Oral History Program on board the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today is Saturday, August 3rd, 2019. Our interview guest was Gordon Hay from Foxborough, Massachusetts. And this recording and any transcripts, abstracts, or indexes made from the recordings will be stored in the Oral History Department of the Battleship New Jersey, the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project, and the New Jersey State Library System. All recordings will be made available to writers, researchers, teachers, and historians. And this is Angela Pizzullo signing off. Good.